women uh, theology and I uh, appreciate and I'm grateful to the organizers for these uh, opportunities. Uh, my paper is uh, uploaded in the Globe uh, Theo uh, link, so uh, you can uh, uh, read it. I will try to read uh, very uh, slowly. I am aware of the time, uh, so I might uh, skip some uh, sections. So, uh, pardon me uh, on that. We are gathered here as community of theologians, students and professors representing different Christian traditions, different nations, yet united in our common identity as Christians, sharing a vision of common good marked by justice and peace. We are hosted by a nation that is in many ways a powerful nation not only an economy that is the envy of many of its neighbors, but also a powerhouse of Christianity in the 21st century. I also find it significant that we are gathered here in a momentous period in, his, in, the, in this nation's political history, with a woman as the head of the state for the first time, and fervent hope of the people for correcting a tragic blunder of history. Presenting the theme, doing Asian women theology acquires an increased sense of empowerment and confidence. It could be a Kairos moment in articulating doing Asian women theology here in Korea. Many theological articulations from Korean Women theologians have contributed to the development of theology arising from Asian women's experience. These works have nurtured and continue to nourish my own theological education. I remember reading the radical book, Struggle to be the Son of Jong Hyung Kyung, and also books on contextual theologizing of shamanism from uh, Korea and Korean theologians which were fundamental to my own uh, studies, and works of Nam Song Kang appearing in ecumenical journals in the recent years have provided a fountain of theological motif. <coughs> drawing, excuse me, drawing from these works as well as other Asian women theologians, I add on to the ongoing conversation of Asian women theology and highlight a theological posture necessary for justice, equality, and a healed nation. This theological posture is marked by questioning, interrogation, and investigation. Pronouncements, statements, and assertions of conditions, experiences, traditions, and voices of women from the region have pointed out the lacunae, pitfalls, and crevices of injustice women in Asia continue to encounter. Articulating a theology from an Asian women's perspective requires an interrogating position to question, to probe, to investigate the right and the wrong that Asian cultures and churches have, have afforded women in their aspirations for dignity and equality. This posture of interrogation is not limited only to an evaluative inquiry of the past, but a posture of interrogation is needed to accompany any present projects of justice and equality. And I shall present this proposition in three parts. First, a brief uh, discussion to clarify the usage of the terms uh, Asian women. Uh, the second part will highlight contextual conditions which will also include dipping into historical resources for portrayal in large strokes, the ba backdrop of the discussion. The final section identifies the areas where interrogation is necessary, I reckon, in articulating women's theology in Asia today. Sections of this uh, presentation comes from my earlier writings, one, a recent one on globalization, which will be appearing in uh, the 
uh, forthcoming Asian Christian Review, and from the history chapter of the book on women and mission history, I co-edited with Kristen Dinaman Perrin and Afri Soma Joy. I get into the section on terms of clarification. Both the terms Asia and uh, women encapsulate multiplicity, diversity and plurality of conditions and cultures. So to state the obvious, the conventional continent of Asia encompasses a set of diverse and multiple uh, contexts. So there is hardly any cultural or political essence of Asia, except that it is a term used by the ancient Greece and popularized by European travelers, explorers, missionaries and imperialists. Asia comprises disparate countries from Japan to Sri Lanka, Nepal to Indonesia, Philippines to Pakistan, and all the countries in between them. Uh, Peter C. Fan has uh, categorized uh, Asia into four uh, categories, and perhaps uh, these four categories uh, uh, has in a way been uh, more uh, helpful in the recent years. Asia is uh, the largest and also the most populous uh, continent. A myriad of indigenous religions and world religions, uh, such as Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, all the world Christianities have their beginnings in the region and, uh, and have uh, utterance in the continent. In the recent years, another perception of Asia has also emerged the uh, modern phenomena of globalization with both its ills and merits has contributed to the economic growth that many countries in Asia have experienced. However, this uh, perception is only a part. Asia is still home to a large population of people living in abject poverty. Therefore, two economic extremities sit together in Asia, enormous wealth on one hand and the other, extreme poverty. Asia, with its multifarious and heterogeneous cultures, also present one of the most diverse socio-economic and religio-cultural contexts pertaining to women in the society. And Kwak Pui Lan emphasizes this, and she cautions against uh, generalizing and monolithic and our historical description of Asian women. And we also have uh, Nam Song Kang in her recent uh, article um, proposing that we need to problematize this term Asian uh, women because it uh, stereotypes uh, Asian women and misrepresents uh, the, the context of Asian women as a category that is culturally essentialized. Therefore, the term Asian women at best can be employed as an umbrella term to represent a multi-layered, multi-dimensional experience of being women in a primarily patriarchal society and its implication, which is a commonality as we have been hearing uh, beginning yesterday from uh, Dr. Kang and uh, this morning, uh, a commonality which is shared among many uh, Asian cultures. Asian century, question mark. As noted in uh, this uh, section, the quintessential feature of a conventional continent of Asia is, is its multiplicity. And given these pluralities of the socio-economic, religious, cultural context, there is not one homogeneous contextual reality that represents the conventional continent of Asia. So therefore, by implication, there is a diversity of uh, conditions that becomes the backdrop of the context of theologizing and reflection. In fact, this diversity itself becomes a rationale for robust theological engagement uh, emanating from Asia. <coughs> Excuse me. In a world that is undergoing sea changes aided by the technological revolution at an unprecedented scale and a rapid speed, the countries, cultures and peoples in Asia are not excluded. In fact, Asia is a major force behind the enormous socio-economic shifts and a center of unfolding global trends, especially in the areas like economic growth and demographic transition. 
In a discussion on demographic shifts, it is important to note that Asia is home to about 60% of young people, which in itself brings major implication for global labor force, consumption, and demands for resources. This also means a growing middle class, consumer class. Now, so therefore, in the recent uh, years, in some quarters in the media, we have been hearing the phrase Asian century in reference to the rising Asia, where arguably the global economy will have its axis, which in turn will tilt, tilt the global <coughs> political power to the Asian continent. Indeed, there is, a, there is a palpable confidence of an emerging Asia, as best exemplified by the title of a book, The New Asian Hemisphere, The Irresistible Shift of Global Power to the East. This is authored by a Singaporean former diplomat who is now in the National University in Singapore, Kishore Mapupani. The continent of Asia today indeed presents enormous opportunities, but simultaneously, large-scale deprivation. <coughs> Excuse me. There are major challenges of human rights violations, globalization and its impact, human trafficking, environmental degradation, ethnic and religious conflicts, migration, gender violence, religious fundamentalism, grass consumerism, and the cumulative impact of this phenomena is the major paradigmatic shifts in the ways of life and cultures in Asia. And this dazzling plurality of socio-cultural canvas of contemporary Asia is rooted in ancient civilizations of almost all the religio-cultural 